Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And a very good evening to everyone. Assalamualaikum, Prof. Good evening, Prof. Good evening, Professor. Hi. Assalamualaikum, Prof. Assalamualaikum. Okay, so um, welcome everyone. Uh, week six. Um, this will be our last class before our break next week. Um, and so tonight's uh, topic, we will continue with um, theoretical framework or theory and use of theory in qualitative research, I should say. Um, that'll be our topic for tonight. Um, and uh, so we'll continue. Um, this, is, this will be our last class for the fasting month for Ramadan. So um, we will continue with uh, the same schedule as the last two weeks. Um, so we'll let our uh, presenters start off and then we'll just sort of play it by ear, see how it goes. Um, I don't want to make any definite plans for the second half of the class because like last week I had plans, but then of course the discussion went quite long. So um, I, I didn't, uh, we didn't do anything other than the um, reading and discussion. So, which is fine. I, I really, I prefer to be flexible with our classes and uh, I try to, meet the needs of the students. So if you have issues you want to discuss, I'll always prioritize that usually. Uh, I'll always usually, no, I will usually prioritize that over um, a planned activity, unless I really feel like that activity is very important. So um, we'll do the same thing tonight, inshallah, and see how it goes. Okay. Um, so let me just um, pull up the yeah, so thank you for that reminder. Please make sure to uh, please make sure to sign in. Okay, everyone. Okay, so please, uh, as you can see up on the screen, please make sure to sign in. Don't forget. Um, although I did go back and um, correct for those that didn't sign in last week, I went back and did it for you. Um, just please make sure to do that. Uh, another reminder that assignment three is due on uh, in two weeks on the 18th. Okay, and you can upload that to Pucha Blast. I have begun to go through your problem statements. I haven't finished them, um, but with the break next week, hopefully I'll, I'll be able to finish them up. Uh, I'm trying to give you some comments back, some feedback on the problem statements. Although I did find that um, several of them so far, your the content of your problem statement is something that I'm not familiar with in terms of topics. So I can't give you real in-depth feedback on the topic of your study uh, and issues related to your content so much, uh, but I'm trying to give a little bit, at least a little bit of basic feedback on structure and stuff like that. So um, I plan to return those to, to you once there, once I've gone through them all. Okay. Um, and so tonight's article is on, um, as I mentioned, uh, on the use of theory in qualitative research. Um, this is a very important issue for qualitative researchers. It's an issue that a lot of students ask about, and I think a lot of uh, people question or have questions about. So it's a really important topic. Um, ideally, again, I, I, I hope that um, some of you at least had a chance to go through the article before the class. Um, it's a really, because it, it does provide you with a sort of step-by-step way of um, considering theory for your study. So it's a very, it's a very useful practical article as well. Um, so I hope you'll consider it uh, for your research. Um, and I think you'll see tonight why. Um, I do have to say though, that this is a topic that can be a little bit difficult. Um, and in fact, some of the issues dealt with in the article tonight are a bit complex. So it may draw some confusion for some people. Uh, which is fine. That's part of the learning process. So um, once again, if there's any questions, please ask, and I'll try my best to answer them. Some of them I may not be able to answer uh, just because um, of the nature of the question and then how the question relates to your particular study. Um, I may not be able to answer, but I'll try my best. Um, and then these are just some questions for you to think about in terms of your theoretical framework. Uh, and I'll revisit these after in the second half of the class. Um, and then finally, uh, there's another, I've posted another article here for your own resource, another article related to theory, use of theory 
um, just as additional reference for you um, to uh, think about. This is a good one because it's based on an actual study. The whole, most of the article is based on an actual study and they show how they use theory in that study. Okay, so if you want further insight into this topic, this is a good article to read. It's from a book chapter actually. Okay, so are there any questions before we start? Any concerns or problems? So we'll go for about an hour until about 10 after seven, um, and then we will uh, take our break and then resume, inshallah. So who are our presenters for tonight? Yes, from group six. All right, group six. Masni, oh, Masni and... Masni and gang. <laughs> Masni and gang. It's like a rock. <laughs> okay, Masni and gang, take it away. The floor is yours. Okay, uh, good afternoon, uh, Professor Dr. Latif and friends. Um, today, uh, we are going to present uh, this topic, how to use social theory within and throughout qualitative research in healthcare context. Oops. So the presenters are Madam Nohayati Mama Yusof, Siti Nur Haslina Matlatif, and myself, Masli Mustafa. Topic um, that we're going to go. Sorry, uh, sorry, Pon Mustang. Before we start, can I just ask you guys as a group? Um, did you find this to be a difficult topic to get through the reading? Uh, quite difficult. Yeah. Okay. That's what I figured. Okay. Go ahead, please. Go ahead. Okay, um, the topic today. Uh, divided into three segments it will be presented by two different people. So the introduction will be done by me. Uh, introduction, what is theory, what is the social in social theory. And the next presenter will present on theory driven or grounded theory. Can there be both? How to integrate theory into research design analysis. And the last presenter will present on data collection and conclusion. So I'm going to start the session. Uh, this is the title, if you forget. And purpose of the research is to describe and demonstrate the use of social theory in the design and analysis of qualitative research. So theories help us explain and predict the phenomena of interest to us and in consequence, in consequence assist us in making intelligent practical decisions, according to Frankfurt and NACMIS 2008. So the main, the main purpose of uh, this introduction, the main points are the centrality of theory in quantitative is widely acknowledged the way in which theory is used is difficult to describe. And much interest from academics and graduate students in how and where social theory plays a role in cognitive health research. Okay, so let me just stop you there. Um, so yeah, so this article, they try to do a few things, which I think are quite effective, actually. It is a bit difficult to get through to some degree, but what's interesting about the article is that they, um, they really provide a sort of uh, framework for working with theory and quality research. Uh, it doesn't mean <clears throat> doesn't mean you have to follow their 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 um, steps or their approach um, completely, but they do give I think a, a good overview of it, and they try to blend both the sort of concepts behind it, uh, the rationale, uh, and then also they try to apply it to an actual study. Uh, so they give examples from an actual uh, study in the health sciences. Um, <clears throat> and so they try to sort of demystify some of the issues around theory and qualitative research. Um, and one of the things that I think is really important is that they, they, um, they make it very clear that uh, qualitative research is not a solely inductive endeavor. Okay, so maybe you've been told or you've heard from people that qualitative research is only inductive. Okay, so first we have to make sure that we're clear about what is the difference between inductive and then deductive. Okay, and then they, they introduce actually two new concepts in this article, which is abductive and retroductive, which we'll touch on. We won't spend too much time talking about them, but is everybody uh, in the class at least clear about what is the difference between inductive and deductive? Because those are important concepts to know. Data collection, data analysis, uh, it is inductive. And uh, deductive means, uh, I think, quantitative research. Well, no, I mean, deductive reasoning and inductive reasoning are not necessarily a, a tied to any particular research method. Yes, that's true. In qualitative research, it tends to be more inductive. 
quantitative tends to be more deductive, but they're not entirely one or the other. So that's why you have to first understand what is induction and what is deduction. And so that's my question. Do, what does, do, do people understand the difference between induction and deduction? What is inductive reasoning versus deductive reasoning? Proof? Yes. So uh, for me, think, yeah. um, for me, induction is from uh, uh, data to theory. Well, deduction is from theory to uh, to <laughs> to analysis or to the application of theory. Okay. On the yeah, that's my understanding. Yeah. Okay. So that's one way of, of looking at it. Anyone else want to chime in? Yes, actually, the inductive is uh, um, inductive is a bottom up approach, and as to the uh, deductive research, it is a top to bottom approach. Okay, so what does that mean? <laughs> bottom just to like bottom. just like uh, Mr. Song. As for the as for the in Inductive way, people will collect, uh, will analyze their data, and then to generalize what's the um, common features of them, and that's the uh, bottom-up approach. And it also it is also called the inductive research. And yeah. as for the deductive uh, uh, research, people will uh, put forward some theory or hypothesis, and then they will, uh, and it is the guideline for them to carry out their research and collect some data. And that's the, what I mean by saying the uh, top to bottom approach. Yeah, okay. All right, good, yeah. So inductively, you start with the particulars and you try to abstract, you try to, uh, like you said, generalize, or you try to uh, uh, understand Universals. So from from particulars to universals, that's induction. Okay. So from the particular raw data you collect, you try to um, sort of universalize or abs make abstractions from that. In other words, you want to come up with some sort of generalization. Whereas deductive is you start with the universal and you try to apply it to specific individual particular incidents or particular um, um, observations. Okay. So you're trying to test that theory or test that uh, sort of in deductive understanding with particular um, incidents, okay? So from the particular to the universal, from the universal to the particular, okay? So that's inductive and the reasoning essentially. And so, yeah, when it comes to, when it's, a, when it's put into the, um, the application of research, when it's used in research, then yes, it plays out as theory building uh, from induction, you build theory, right? You go from the particular to the universal. And then from the deductive approach or the quantitative approach, you test theory. So you take a theory, you start with a universal, you start with a generalized view of the world, a conceptual understanding of something, and then you apply it to a particular setting or a particular observation to see whether that theory holds in that particular place. So that's the sort of opposite. So it's, but it's quite common in qualitative research, actually, to have elements of both. It's not entirely inductive. And that's sort of the point here to this article, is that they show how you use both in the study. Okay, And so it's really important to understand. Because if you're saying you're using a theoretical framework in a study, that means there is an element of deduction that we have to really acknowledge. Okay. All right. So, um, Masni, uh, Pon Masni, please, sorry, I interrupted. Take it away. Okay, um, so what is theory? Sociological research has changed historically from the philosophical generation of theory towards empirical research, which expands or generates evidence based on theory. So based on philosophy, theory is built on moral judgments on how things ought to be and not empirically verified. While theory um, defines it as rather than being concerned of what they should be, they are concerned with how and why of empirical phenomena are in the explanation. Yeah. So theory really is grounded, or it should be grounded in empirical findings, some sort of empirical, whether it's an observational finding or um, theory is not the same as philosophy. And it's important to understand that. A lot of people think that theory is just some idea in someone's head, but really good theory is really driven by data. It's driven by uh, observation. 
uh, and it's it's tested. And so a theory develops and it gains strength. It gains epistemological strength through ongoing verification, validation, testing, etc. So you will come across in the literature, and this is what another good point about this article is they make it very clear that a theoretical gap, okay, and a lot of students ask about a theoretical gap. They don't really understand what is a theoretical gap. Oftentimes, a, a, theoretical, a theoretical gap is nothing more than the fact that a particular theory you're using or you want to use has never or has very rarely been actually tested empirically. Okay, so it's more, it's just at the conceptual level, right? And so it's based on maybe an, um, an uh, a scientist or uh, an author's view of previous studies, previous literature, and so forth. So they've built this idea based on previous research, but they've never actually tested that theory, or they've never tested it in a particular setting, like you're going to like you're going to use. That essentially is a theoretical gap, okay? Especially if a theory has never been actually tested, that's a big time theoretical gap, right? So that can be that can be um, mentioned as your as your theoretical gap, okay? So that's important to understand. Okay, uh, next, please. Different types of theories serve different purposes. Theories are described as interpretation, giving order and insight into what is or can be observed, according to Denzin 1889. Systematically organized knowledge device to analyze, predict, or otherwise explain the nature of behavior, according to Van Ryan and his Keeney 1992. Logical deductive system consists of a set of interrelated concepts, according to Frankfurt and Myers 2008. When theories you reach down to fundamentals, up to abstractions and probe into experience, according to Kamesh 2006. So the central feature of social theory consists of a set of concepts that form conceptual scheme or framework. So theory is not, um, again, this is another point of confusion for a lot of students, is this idea that Theory means grand theory, okay? So there are very, there are many different types of theories. And sometimes just a theoretical or conceptual model that someone came up with from a study can be considered a theory, all right? So theory has different levels, it has different um, uh, forms, okay? Uh, different, different types of, um, or different degrees of um, uh, rigor, like previous use of those theories. So for example, sometimes theories, uh, you know, there's well-used theories that have been around for years, right? Some of these grand, grand theories that we read about in our literature, right? theory of planned behavior or uh, such. So those are grand theories, but those are not the only theories that can be used as uh, a, a to under sort of un, undergird or provide foundation for your, for your study, okay? So, any kind of conceptual understanding or formal conceptual explanation that is uh, put forward by um, uh, a scholar can be considered a theoretical, found, can be considered a theory, okay? So it's not necessarily grand theory. Right? Um, just trying to see if there's anything else in here. Okay, uh, it is a set of interrelated concepts. And so it, it attempts to explain a phenomenon and that's really important. Theories try to explain social phenomena, especially social theory, of course, try to explain phenomena. Okay, so you have a set of variables or a set of concepts that are interconnected, interrelated. Okay, that is essentially a theory. Okay, go ahead, um, unless there's any questions. Juan Masni, are you there? Yeah, I thought you were waiting for him to ask. Okay, I continue. <laughs> no, no, I said, if, if there are any questions, feel free to ask. Otherwise, we can continue. All right. Concepts are descriptive and operative and specify empirical relationships between other elements in theory. When we become interrelated, then theory begins to emerge. Concepts are variables to be observed between which empirical relationships are sought, according to Mutter 1968. At this point, theory can be used to explain the why, what, and how of phenomena. Right. Okay. So, again, it's based on based on relationships between concepts. Okay. What is the, what is the social in social theory? The researchers understanding and define social will impact the design or interpretation of results when engaging with social theory. 
communication and interaction according to element 1995 i don't know how to pronounce table mass 2001 not natural or given state fuller 2006 social facts in any way of acting whether fixed or not capable or of exerting over the individual and external constraint external entity outside people and society and community is more than just a conglomerate of individuals Okay. So, so they just here they're elaborating a little bit on what social theory refers to. It's not that uh, pertinent to what we're studying, but uh, just it's, in, it's just it's just interesting to sort of read about. Okay, go ahead. What is meant by social? Society and community is more than just a conglomerate of individuals. Individuals and societies are two different aspects of the same human being. So this this is known as multi-level or hierarchical analysis. Yeah, so the, our, there are great challenges in studying um, the social world. Um, so social theory tends to be comp compli complicated and it's, it is notoriously poor in explaining phenomenon actually. Um, and they've sort of done this, this they've sort of tested these, these, these ideas that social theory tends to be quite poor in explaining social phenomena. And that's because of the fact that, um, you know, the, hum the world of the human being is so complex right um, individuals and societies uh, are really hard to study because of the complexity of us as creatures as beings and then the fact that we are always interacting with our environment and how we interact with our environment which is why like in, they give the example of multi-level uh, analysis and quantitative methods you know they're coming up with more and more sophisticated methods for studying different levels of, of social social life you know so for example if you want to study a student in school, you have to consider the individual student. You have to consider their um, uh, different, what, what are called different and uh, different nested sort of realities. Um, the influence of the class, the student in the class, the influence of the student in the school as a whole, the influence of the student's family, uh, friends. So there's all these different layers of, of social reality that make analysis quite challenging especially for quantitative researchers and this also is uh is a reason one reason why i think um qualitative research is continuing to gain more uh, attention by the research community because of the fact that qualitative studies allow for a much uh more nuanced understanding of people's lives and their social worlds in ways that quantitative researchers really has a hard time doing Okay, so that's one of the uh, I think positives, one of the strengths of qualitative research. Okay. Sociological imagination means to fully understand social, need to think imaginatively beyond what we can observe and measure. We cannot measure every dimension of social life, for example, love, hate, fear, quality of life, etc. So we need to develop and measure conceptual proxies or indicators that the understanding and explanations can be developed. Yeah. So yeah, these are the challenges, all those dimensions of human life, which are very hard to, uh, to measure, right? And, but that's why in quantitative research, they have proxies for all these things. You know, we come up with measurement scales to measure hate, you know, to measure fear. You know, we have quality of life indicators, so many, right? Now they're not they're not cap actually capturing lived realities, but they are what are called proxies or they're indicators of these things. And so they're really just estimations, really just estimations. And so that's the best that we can really do, uh, especially in the quantitative sciences. Okay. Okay. The next uh, we'll pass to my friend, theory driven or grounded theory. my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Your friend is not there. Okay, All so, right. Yeah, now we get uh, into so, the inductive deductive uh, issue. Okay, go ahead. Sorry, pass me now. All right. Uh, uh, sorry that I can't, uh, I sorry if I can't switch on my video. My oh, it's okay. internet is quite unstable. No problem, no problem. All right. So uh, my subtopic will be discussing on theory driven or grounded theory. Can there be both? So, Next. 
Okay, when we talk about uh, theory driven or grounded theory, uh, first and foremost, we must know that both theory and that data are vital or it's very important elements of research. So basically, theory moves data from description to explanation. This is um, given by Punch 2000. And theory actually fits in the research process. But then the question is before or after the data. But then towards the end, uh, during the discussion, we will see how it fits in, right? So uh, next, before, next page, come. All right. Um, in establishing links between observation and theory, first we will discuss about the definition of what is theory driven and what is grounded theory. As what uh, Prof has mentioned, uh, Prof has mentioned earlier about deductive and inductive approach. Right. So theory driven is actually a deductive approach. Um, as what Prof mentioned earlier, it was from particular to something universal. So a deductive approach for theory driven is where it uses theory to design the research in expanding, testing, and verify the theory. Whereas in grounded theory, um, it's from universal to particular, which means an inductive approach. Uh, it uses the data to expose theoretical possibilities or categories and aims to develop theory. So this is a huge gap between theory-driven and also grounded theory. Yes. Uh, and then uh, theory-driven is also known as theory-first and grounded theory is also known as theory-after. Theory development, that's why it's called grounded theory. It comes from the ground. So it's theory developed from the ground, from the data, right? So it's it's sort of na its name kind of implies how it actually occurs. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, so next page. Okay. Which is better? Now, uh, this is one of the arguments uh, that we can find in this article. It's either approach can be appropriate, but in this re research, it says that some sometimes both um, research will, uh, both will be appropriate, meaning that uh, the integrating of theory driven and also grounded theory, yeah. right? But then um, when we talk about uh, both, right, we have to look at, um, next page please. It depends on, okay, so it depends on the topic, the context, the practical circumstances of the research and how much prior theorizing and knowledge exists in the area. Okay, so this is a really important uh, topic, uh, subtopic that you're going into now. Uh, so how do you know when to use which? Or how do you know when to make your study more deductive or more inductive? Okay, so this is, <clears throat> this is where we really have to be, uh, be paying close attention to because this is gonna affect, I think, all of, you, all of you in terms of how you do your study and how you choose how you design your studies, okay? So, yeah, it really depends. Um, well, actually, maybe, Hasina, I'll let you. Uh, do you have more on this slide to talk about, or is that it? Uh, I do have a few, but then it's on the critics of the grounded theory. Oh, no. It's so... on the theory-driven, a few. But then if you want to discuss... Yeah, just that, let's go back to that previous okay. slide. Yeah. So, uh, in fact, some of you, I'm, I'm having this discussion right now, like um, Puan Masni, I was, we were just discussing before the class about her topic, and these are the kind of things that you need to think about. Um, and so when you start to do your real review of the literature, you have to look for these things, you know? So for example, a topic that has a rich, um, uh, a sort of rich literature behind it, you know? In other words, a topic that's been well studied, right? If you have a topic that's been well studied, but just maybe in your particular context, it hasn't been studied that much, right? But there has been a lot of research on it. There are theories that have been used in relation to it, okay? You're not going to want to more or less do a grounded theory, you know, uh, or a um, more or less fully inductive study. It's, it's, it would be kind of like reinventing the wheel, right? You've already got a rich sort of literature there to work from, so there's really no need um, to do that. But you feel that there's things you can still learn. There's, there's still things to learn and to uncover because you're studying in maybe a new cultural setting or a different organizational setting or something. So in that case, you're going to want to bring in that previous work, right? Not just the empirical studies, but the theory, 
or the theoretical work that's been used as well. And so from that kind of a, for that particular type of study, you may want to use, uh, you may want to have a very sort of well-established theoretical framework and use a combination of deductive and inductive methods. So maybe you want to even do some, you want to uh, develop pre-existing coding categories from the literature review, right? And then when you analyze your data, you start off with those pre-existing coding categories, right? Um, because again, you have a lot of literature to draw from, all right? Um, as opposed to just going in completely inductively with no preset coding uh, framework. All right, so that's really your, it's your, your um, sort of analysis of the literature of the past work that's been done in that area can help and will guide you on whether you use, uh, how you use theory in your study, okay? Are you using a theory heavy uh, sort of approach or are you using a very, you know, very little theory, previous theory? Okay, um, so it really depends on the topic, the context of the study, like I said, and then even the practical circumstances of the research. How practical do you want your findings to be? You know, is this a study that's going to have a real, you feel it's going to have a real direct impact on practice in your particular field? Or is it more, you know, more just for knowledge sake? Um, that's another consideration, right? Um, along with how much prior knowledge is, which is, as I just sort of mentioned. Okay, so these are kind of the, these are decisions you have to make based on your reading and your evaluation of the literature. All right, there's really no other way. There's no other way to, to put it. There's no other criteria that you can really use all right, to determine that. All right, it's really up to you. Whatever it is, whichever approach you use, you have to justify it. You have to defend it. Okay, so why did you use, you know, this particular theoretical framework? All right, so that's important. Any questions about any of that? No? Okay. Haslina, you can continue then. No? All right. Thank you. All right. So when we talk about grounded, grounded theory and also theory driven, there are a few critics um, on these two. All right. So this will be... Um, some of the critics for grounded of the grounded theory, the absence of an initial theoretical framework may have an underlying general perspective. This is Corbin and Hobbes, 2011. Um, and then uh, it recognizes the difficulty or even impossibility of gathering data in the complete absence of theoretical ideas. Uh, so this will be the arguments for the grounded theory, an interpretive portrayal of the studied world, not an exact picture of it. So basically, when we talk about the grounded theory, they have two different groups. So the first group is the, tra the, the, the traditional grounded theory, which suggested that the researcher goes into research with, with an empty slate or tabula rasa. But then the other group, the constructive uh, TV uh, grounded theory, they argued that the researcher uh, should go into doing research with an open mind rather than something like so empty. So right. this would be the critique of the grounded theory. See, the, the problem here is that um, the, the constructivist group argues that nobody can really be an empty slate uh, because of what's called implicit theory. In other words, we, mm. we use implicit theory all the time, even though we don't realize it. So for example, we may think we're going into a, a setting to study it without any um, theory at our disposal or not really relying on any ex, uh, sort of conscious use of theory, but based on our theoretical bias, the way we've been educated, um, what we've studied in the past, any particular assumptions or biases we've had about that topic, our experiences with that topic, those are all gonna form implicit theoretical frameworks in our mind. So we may not know it or may not realize it, but we're actually going into the study, looking at it in a particular way. That is an implicit, that is the use of implicit theory, essentially. That's implicit theory. So there's an implicit theoretical bias there with that we're not even really aware of. And so they argue that it really you cannot go into anything tabula rasa, doesn't really exist. And so that's why they say it's better to be up aware of your um, you know, theoretical framework that you're using and just be open-minded about using it Right. So in other words, you know what theoretical framework you're using, but you're also open to new things that come that are outside of the theoretical framework. All right. And so that's become sort of the mainstream approach to doing a lot of qualitative research is this idea that 
we have to start with something. We have to have some theoretical starting point. We have to have some theoretical frame or theoretical lens that we're going to approach this topic from. But at the same time, we try to leave ourselves open to new ideas, things that are outside of the theory that might arise when we go and do the research. Okay, so it's sort of like a happy medium. It's it's using theory, but not being sort of handcuffed by the theory, right? Whereas if you're using a completely deductive approach, you can only look at that topic through the lens of that theory. Anything outside that theory disproves the theory, right? And so it's either the theory has been proven or disproven. That's really what the deductive approach is, is really about, okay? Whereas um, this approach, this sort of integrated approach uses theory, but allows for the... Um, um, arising of new new ideas and um, new data that's outside the theory. Okay, so that's that's what they're arguing here. Okay, any questions about that or comments? Okay. Okay. So shall I? Yeah. yeah please, please go ahead. Uh, so the next um, is the critics of theory driven. So it is also being criticized. So these are some of the criticism of uh, theory driven. First, the researcher cannot logically identify the unintended artifacts of emp empirical data filtered. This is by Corinna Da, 2010. And then uh, they are accused of uh, conducting empirical research for the sole purpose of testing theory rather than em empirical outcomes. And, the third one, an interpretive portrayal of the studied world, not an exact picture of it. So this would be the criticism received by the theory-driven uh, researchers, I believe. Yeah, so the so critique, next, of, oh, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> the critique of deductive approaches is this, like I just mentioned, is that the deduction implies that you're, test, you're testing a certain theory, a certain way of looking at the world. So when that theory is disproven, um, again, it's not. There's not much else you can do with it, right? So it's heavily, heavily relying on a certain way of looking at reality of the world, uh, and so forth. Um, and so people question the 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 relevance of that, the practicality of that, especially if you're doing social research that you hope to have some impact on the social world or practice and so forth. Um, and so it. The, the criticism is that it just becomes a sort of academic exercise of testing this theory and you know, just trying to prove that a certain theory is, is, um, is at play in a, in a certain setting, uh, but its practicality is, is, is really questioned. Okay, so <clears throat> this and some of the critiques of the purely deductive approach okay, that you get in quantitative studies. <clears throat> okay. All right, uh, next. So when we talk about this, uh, we have to consider that research question is the, means, uh, the most important part. So research question provides a basis for the integration of theory yeah. before or after the data. So it is a common practice to use both approaches, whether it's grounded theory or theory driven or combine both. But then uh, when both theories been used, grounded theory and also theory driven to be used in one paper. The most important, uh, the, the, the challenging part would be how to explain uh, these uh, theories to be used yeah. in a research. Yeah, so, so that's really the this point of this. Be what, uh, right. <laughs> Sorry, I, I cut you off. I thought you were done. Sorry. <clears throat> All right. So that's really the point of the article is to really <laughs> yeah. try to explain okay. how these approaches are used together. Okay. okay, next. Um, so what's in this paper? So basically, uh, in this paper, it describes about a uh, few things. One, about a pluralistic approach for theory, um, which is an integrative methodology for social theoretical research. Uh, here, um, it tells about this uh, research, about how they approach uh, they involve uh, multiple modes of interrelated infer uh, inference, right? So here, multiple modes of interrelated 
inference allow the researchers to start with a priority theory for testing, which allowing for novel theory to emerge from the data. And then uh, the third thing would be research design start with appropriate theory uh, because it provides a basis for a premise in need of testing, refining, extending, or retesting. Yeah. So again, it's this idea that you can start with a theory, uh, but through your study, that theory purpose. can be refined and extended and so forth. Okay, so their approach that they're presenting in this paper is what they call an inter integrated approach. So start with theory, which is, is deductive, okay, but then allowing for an inductive process to occur and then trying to explain, this is the part that's really unique about this paper is that they tried to explain how using these two, uh, deductive and inductive leads to another process that eventually uh, leads to a re-theorizing or an, an extension of theory, right? And so they sort of tried to uh, explain that process. Okay, so it's, it's a good, a really good attempt to do that, I think. All right. Because a lot uh, of, so in sorry, sorry, a lot of students, they, they get stuck, especially in their data analysis part of their study. I find a lot and they get stuck once they find, a, they get a result or they get an emerging finding from their data that doesn't fit within their initial framework and they don't really know what to do with it. They don't know, they don't know really how to handle that data, what to do with it, um, how to make sense of uh, their existing theoretical framework in light of that data. You know, so they sort of hit a wall at that point. And so this is, it's an important, it's important that we think about before we start our research or while we're doing our research now, if you're already in your research, how are you gonna deal with that issue when it comes up? Okay. So, okay, go ahead. All right. Okay. So now we move on to the research um, objective, which is the aim of this paper. Basically, uh, it describe, try to describe and demonstrate the use of social theory in the design and analysis of qualitative research. Uh, second, to demonstrate a pluralistic methodological approach to theory verification and generation, which leads to demonstrating uh, the role of theory in both the design uh, and analysis of qualitative data and how empirical research can both test theory and allow theory to emerge from data. So here in this uh, research, in this article, they also have introduced seven steps, uh, how to integrate theory into research design and analysis. Um, so okay. next, okay. So these are the seven steps uh, been mentioned by the researchers about uh, how to integrate theory into research designs and uh, research design and analysis. So the first step, step one, um, systematically search the literature in the area of theoretical and empirical interest. So here they suggest that uh, they've been using, um, we should consider uh, about identifying um, empiric, uh, gaps for empirical investigation. We might consider conducting a systematic review as part of our research in this first step, right? Uh, in the second step, identifying um, social theories. So here, perhaps we look at the potential and um, theories, social theories that have been used in this area previously before this by the other researchers in the research area. Perhaps we're gonna look at uh, who are the prominent, prominent uh, theories in the area, okay, things like that. So. In the third step, sorry, sorry, uh, sorry. Particular... Oh. Lina, can I stop you there? The step, step two, there's another question you, there's another yeah, question yeah, sure. in the article, there's another question that's very important. So you, you mentioned about identifying the social theories and you said, who are the prominent theories in this area? That's in the, that's what they say in the article. The next question that they ask is the most important one though. Have these theories been tested empirically or is the theory too abstract for practical application? So if you've identified a theory that you think really um, speaks to what you want to study and the topic that you're studying, you have to then go and look at to what extent has this theory actually been used in research? Has the theory actually even been tested? <clears throat> has it been tested in the type of research setting that you're testing it in, that you want to use it in? 
Okay, so that's where you can begin to develop your research, uh, so your theoretical gap. Okay, and that's very that's important. Okay, sorry. Go ahead. All right. Thank you. Yes. Hello. Sorry. Okay. Uh, next step, uh, the third step, uh, critically analyze the social theories of interest. So here it involved in uh, we have to identify any empirical gaps in the theory, uh, relevant critics of the practical application of theory, um, especially what we are doing, I mean, the research, and relevant critics of this theory uh, by identifying problems with the operationalization of these theories in a real life settings. So this would be the third step. So step four, um, we need to develop uh, a conceptual framework in order to operationalize uh, the theory using appropriate methods. So here, the researchers uh, somehow have suggested us how it should be done. Um, perhaps we can do the abstract theory first and then moving on to the concept <coughs> and going to the empirical design to investigate the phenomenon, right? Uh, next step, step five. Step five, we have to design the research with the aim of investigating both empirical and theoretical gaps. So here, with regards to the theory, um, our research uh, should be researchable and we have to investigate the role of the risk in trust uh, by sampling according to the level needs to be used to design the research method. So, um, but then uh, what's, in, what's been said that this step is normally often not included in the theory-driven research. Uh, so this is step five. Uh, in step six, the data collection and analysis. This is um, somehow a prof I mentioned earlier, which is the most important uh, step as well. But then this... Uh, Step will be discussed further detail by my friend Nohayati later on. And then lastly will be step seven, write up your research. So Yati will discuss further on data collection and analysis step. Yeah, this is the tricky one. It gets a little complex yeah. here. Okay. Right. Thank All you. Right. Assalamualaikum. Uh, all right. Thank you so much. All right. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Yeah, Hope and uh, Pleasant evening, everyone. Okay, I'm going to continue with the data collection. Okay, so as what Prof mentioned just now, this is the tricky part of uh, uh, research. Okay, so in data collection, um, we have the iterative and, uh, and analysis should be a large part of, the, of this. Okay, what does it mean by iterative? It, is, it should be frequent. Okay, when... Uh, Analysis, uh, analysis should begin after the first interview and continue throughout data collection. So this is this is like a, an ongoing uh, process. And the second one is the use of uh, of extreme case sampling. Denmark et al. 1997. Okay, what does it mean by um, uh, the use uh, the use of of extreme case sampling. Okay, this is what we call outliers or cases that do not fit the overall picture should be sought out. Okay, so uh, outliers um, refers to the odd data uh, compared to the majority of data. All right. Okay, so uh, next. So, sorry, can I just stop you? <clears throat> so, um, <clears throat> yeah, so iterative <clears throat> implies it should be ongoing. Okay, so in, for those of you, you should know this by now, but for those of you who don't, your data collection process and, and analysis process go hand in hand, okay? So once you begin to collect your data, immediately you would begin to analyze that data, all right? And so there's this back and forth. So back and forth, constant comparative, iterative process, it's all the kind of flow of a qualitative study. It's like, it's not very linear. Yeah, it's not very linear. It goes back and forth. Okay, so um, you're when you get new data, you're compare you're you're un, you're trying to understand that data, making sense of that data, but you're also comparing it to the previous data you've collected. You're also comparing it to the emerging findings you've developed. For example, your codes or maybe your categories. So this is the constant comparative approach uh, to data data analysis as well. It's a constantly going back and forth, constantly comparing. Um, new data with with previous data and and emerging uh, findings. 
Okay, so <clears throat> this is the process and the flow of qualitative data collection and analysis. Okay. Okay. Uh, Hattie, go ahead. okay, next, please. Uh, wait, the, the slide stuck. <laughs> oh, the slide stuck. The slide wants to book a bus, I think. <laughs> <laughs> wait, I, know when, uh... I should finish first. <laughs> Uh, Mas, you want me to share and say it? Okay. All right. Okay. Alhamdulillah. All right. So uh, the second part, okay, uh, the, the, uh, the data analysis. Okay. So the first one, it involves a lot of data organization, okay, manually or by using programs. So, so what does it mean by manually? Manually, Yes, you can even use mind maps. Okay, you can have paper organization and so on. And by using programs, yes, we have lots of programs, for example, and Vivo, Atlas TI, and so on. All right, and then the second one, it is complex and abstract task. Okay, what does it mean by that? Okay, this is, it is criticized as lack of detail, coherent and ambiguity. Okay, what does it mean by ambiguity? It is, can be interpret, uh, where it can have more than one interpretation. All right, so that, that, what does it mean by ambiguity? All right, and then the third one, this is rigid uh, uh, theoretical framework, okay, lead researchers to eliminate data re uh, relevant to research question. Okay, so this is, uh, I think this is quite tricky. Somehow we might um, uh, neglect or ignore uh, some of the uh, important uh, uh, data that we, that we have collected. Okay, then, uh, Number four, data which fall outside the theory or literature may lead to new insights. Okay, so it, so this reflects to the uh, third point just now that um, we uh, we should not okay neglect uh, the data okay that maybe doesn't fit okay the theory or literature okay then so this is where uh, the grounded theory is uh, borrowed. Okay, so let me just elaborate a bit. So <clears throat> yeah, number one, it, qualitative research involves a lot of data. So you have to have it, or it has to be organized. So you need a system for organizing your data. So whether you choose to use NVivo or Atlas TI or a, a computer program, you may do that. You don't have to though. The goal is just to have an organized, um, a system of organizing your data, a system of, of analyzing it in a way that, you know, you can easily keep track of it. You can easily catalog it. You can easily make references and so, and stuff and so forth. So those software programs allow for that, but it's not required. Okay, so don't, no supervisor should tell you that you're required to use in vivo or anything like that. Okay, so that's important to know. Uh, secondly, it is, it is a complex and abstract task. It is certainly nothing like quantitative research analysis, uh, quantitative data analysis, nothing at all like it. Okay, um, and it's often criticized, yes, that's true, for having, uh, for the process to have a lack of uh, detail and coherence and so forth. Um, so that's your job really to document. Uh, you must document what you do when you analyze your data, okay? And this is often done through a lot of what's called memoing, right? So when you, when you analyze an interview, um, when you arrive at a, at a theme, you know that how you arrived at the theme should be documented somewhere. And this is usually documented in what are called memos, where you're writing out, you're explaining and describing what you did and how you arrived at that finding. Okay, so that's that's that should go hand in hand with the finding itself, and so like in vivo, that's why they have a separate function for memos, so that you can you know document all the the steps that you that you that you're undertaking and then the rationale for those steps. Uh, so don't make your theoretical framework too rigid, and this is what we were referring to before. If your theoretical framework is too rigid, you're going to end up eliminating data that's undoubtedly going to be relevant to your research question. Okay. So qualitative study, you know, sometimes it's a, you get a lot of surprising results, like data comes out of nowhere that you didn't think of. Oh, I didn't think of that. Oh, where did that come from? Oh, that's really interesting. Something new, novel. I didn't expect that. That is undoubtedly going to happen in your qualitative study, right? And so if your theoretical framework is too rigid, you risk eliminating some of that really important um, data because that's that's what might lead you to, to new insights that might lead you to expanding a theory in a new direction or something like that. And if you're theoretical, if you're too rigid with your theoretical framework, you're gonna miss that. Okay, so again, theoretical framework is a guide. It is a guide, it is a starting point, but it's not something that should limit your uh, uh, ability to be creative and develop 
uh, new directions for theory. Okay, because this is like number four, it leads to new insights. This is where the new insights come from, all right? New insights come from data that was previously undiscovered, not part of a theoretical framework, all right? And so you need to be open to that flexible. And that's one of the big differences between a quantitative and a qualitative researcher is the ability to be flexible and to be open to new insights and new things. Okay, uh, I think you can continue unless there's a question. Mm -hmm. Oh, do you have a question? Yes, <clears throat> I have a question about the extreme case samplings. And when it uh, when we talk about the extreme case samplings, are they supposed not to be included in our research? No, they're saying they're, they, they can be a useful tool in your research. They can help you to expand your understanding of the phenomenon. In other words, um, if, mm -hmm. go ahead. So when or in which stage should we carry out or think about uh, yeah. the extreme case sampling? Well, yeah, you wouldn't use it very early on. It would, it would, be, it would, it would come later usually. Um, once you've got a sort of a well-established finding that you think works really well, then to strengthen that finding, to, to, to ensure that you've, you know, you sort of covered, um, to ensure that your theory is what's called parsimonious or your findings person. In other words, it's a uh, it's, it's, you've taken everything into account. In other words, you, you think you've reached saturation point and everything's been accounted for. Then you go for an extreme case just to see whether there's something else there that you didn't think of, you didn't find previously, right? That it, it sort of is a way of ensuring that you've reached saturation. So and not, not enough, not enough people use it as a method for ensuring uh, saturation, which is a shame because it's a very effective way of, of doing it. So it means that uh, it is better for us to think it fully before the uh, before before we carry out our research, right? Well, you may you may not be able to identify the extreme case in the beginning of the study. For example, like in the example they give in the in the article, they talk about uh, studying um, familiar uh, doc, being familiar with a doctor, for example, and its impact on trust between patient and doctor. Right. So what they want to do is they want to find whether this their theory really held true. So what they did was they after they got they sort of um, got their emerging findings, um, they then went into the, uh, the uh, emergency rooms and interviewed patients that had no relationship with their doctors to see whether familiarity was really a prerequisite of trust. Right. So if you just if you talk to the average patient who has a relationship with the doctor, you know, they'll say, oh, yeah, familiarity is so important with trust, right? But then if you go to an emergency room and you talk to people who have never had any contact with a doctor and, they'll, and you ask them, do you trust this doctor? And what they found was that many of them still did trust the doctor, even though they had no familiarity with the doctor at all. So that forced them to rethink the theory. Okay, wait a minute. Maybe familiarity is not a prerequisite or is not the only pre prerequisite. Maybe there's something else to this issue of trust. And that made them expand the theory beyond familiarity, you see? So it helps, mm -hmm. those negative cases help you to expand that understanding of the theory. Okay. So it, it is a very effective uh, tool uh, and not enough people, use, not, enough stu not enough students especially, not enough um, people use it as a, as, a, as, a, as a method for, because, you know, unfortunately, a lot of our students, PhD, uh, qualitative studies, they're, they don't really, students, they don't really come up with a lot of very new things, very novel things. It's very much, you know, similar to what's in the literature. There's nothing really robust or novel or new or, and I think this is one of the reasons why that students are afraid to sort of take chances. They're afraid to do something like go into the extreme cases to see whether there's something new there. But we really should, we really should. It can really uh, add to the, to the finding. So, so when uh, when the new insight occurs, uh, when we take the extreme case sampling into consideration, then should we write down the cases about it on oh, yeah. our papers yeah. of the dissertation? Sure, absolutely. Okay, okay, yeah. got it. Thank you so much. Yep, sure. Okay, Hayati. All right. 
Okay, then, okay, the analysis process needs to be comprehensive and rigorous, okay, you should uh, you should be in uh, detail and the uh, analytical process move backwards from the uh, data concept uh, to theory uh, uh, as the, um, it is as the reverse of uh, abstract uh, theory uh, to concept and empirical design to investigate phenomena. All right, okay, the, the three traces to this process. Okay, the first one is the pre-coding. Uh, the second one is the conceptual and thematic categorization. And the third one is the theoretical categorization. All right. Okay, this is a pretty common um, yeah. sort of approach, yeah. Okay, so this is uh, uh, the data collection uh, analysis uh, process adapted from Ryman 2012, okay? So we can see here, uh, the, the first step is the collection of uh, relevant data, the interpretation of data, conceptual and theoretical work, and then again, going back to interpretation of data. So this is what does mean by ongoing process where uh, it goes hand in hand, okay? Then the next, the title uh, specification of research, going to collection of further data and going back to interpretation of data. All right. Okay, so you see the iterative nature of it. It's not linear. It goes in a sort of cycle, but even that yeah. cycle is not necessarily a cycle. It's it depends on what you know what emerges from the data, right? So again, flexibility is the key here. Right. So those arrows can go in different directions. Like here, between two and three, you know, there's a back and forth there, and it really depends on what the situation calls for. Okay, so it's not a linear process. Hmm. Okay, so what is said by Gates, okay, 2007, theory provides a structured framework for the explanation of such an analysis and is an integral part of quality, quality qualitative data analysis. All right. Okay, so, uh, so it's, these are the details of data analysis. Can see, uh, okay, data analysis uh, consists of, okay, the first one, okay, the first step is the uh, pre coding. So, in the pre coding, uh, to code aspect of the data beyond theoretical frame, dated 1998, to be open to emergence of unexpected data, okay, what uh, as what Prof mentioned just now, okay, so uh, here, uh, uh, we uh, cannot neglect or ignore uh, the, the emergence of unexpected data. Okay, it might be useful later in our research, okay? So they have the potential um, uh, uh, to, on, uh, in the relevance of the aim of the research itself. Okay, and the second one is a conceptual and thematic categorization to examine the original codes from a conceptual or thematic perspective. Codes that did not fit with the current conceptual model may be slotted into other categories later on. So here, uh, the one that uh, doesn't fit into the initial conceptual categories are, uh, the one that fit into the initial conceptual categories are categorized uh, accordingly, whereas those uh, 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 which don't fit maybe will be useful later or maybe slotted in other categories, all right? So, so this is the phase where we can see whether what we have initially coded, whether it fits within the pre-existing theoretical framework or not, right? So this is where we make that determination. All right. Okay, and then the theoretical categorization, okay, to identify areas for further empirical research of the theoretical expansion. And many sections of text will fit more than one conceptual or theoretical category. All right, okay. All right, next. Can I, sorry, can I just ask something back from the previous slide? Go ahead. Yeah, because when I, when I, when I read through the paper talking about these three things, um, it's, it's actually going back to the, the steps of coding in grounded theory methods, right? Whereby that we start with open coding, which is the pre-coding, meaning you just code without any um, theory, just openly that code. Is, then the second one is. is actually the axial coding, yep. where you start the concepts and the final third round is actually the theoretical coding process. Yeah, uh, similar. Am I understanding it correctly here? 
yeah, again, there's a lot of overlap. And again, it's, it's an issue of jargon. Um, and they're not exactly the same, but they're, yeah, they're very similar, very similar. Um, the first one, it's, the first one is the, is the, is the fully inductive approach. You know, you're pre-coding, you're open coding, or you're just coding openly. If it fits within the, the you know, the pre, pre-designed theoretical uh, classification, you, you can code it that way. If it's outside of that initial theoretical framework, you code it, you know, anyway, right? And so then in the second, in your, what you call the actual coding phase or the category or the conceptual um, categorization phase, that's where we begin to combine codes and determine whether whether codes are, um, um, whether they are outside of the initial uh, theoretical framework, right? So we begin to conceptualize our codes. So the, so the initial coding may be very descriptive, right? But they have to be, they have to be, um, they have to be conceptualized. And that's, I mean, that's really the point of qualitative research is to go from, again, go from raw data to, to, uh, to theorizing essentially. And so that's a process of conceptualization with every stage you get more conceptual. So on the second stage, you're taking that, those raw codes and you're tra- beginning the process of concept, turning them into concepts basically, all right? Um, but you're not yet tying them to theory, to actual theory. That's the last stage, right? Where you begin to categorize those concepts by the existing theory, or if there's a need for bringing in new theory or developing existing theory. And that's what they talk about in the next phase. Right. So, yeah, so there is very much a lot of overlap here, uh, with grounded theory. All right. Okay, next. Okay, so these are the uh, four forms of inference. Okay, the one that we discussed uh, uh, just now, the first one is the deductive. Okay, so it provides an initial theoretical premise of analysis. Okay, so this is the one that we to test existing theory and uh, uh, from uh, general to specific. And here the second one is inductive. Okay, so the aim is to develop a theory. Okay, so the, it permits the emergence of data beyond the theoretical frame, and it moves from specific observation to broad general, uh, generalization. Okay, next. Okay, so these two are rarely mentioned in social science uh, method compared to the first two. Okay, the, uh, the third one is the adapt, uh, adaptive, okay, to discover circumstances and structures that are not given an individual empirical data. Okay, starts with an empirical event or phenomenon that is related to a theory and leads to a new one. Okay, uh, abduction involves describing and understanding the world from the participant's perspective and then deriving a scientific explanation or account of the world as seen through the participant by 2012. And uh, the fourth, it will be the retroductive uh, that social really uh, it says that uh, social reality consists of structures and eternally related objects and need to go beyond what is empirically observable. Okay, seeking to clarify the basic uh, prerequisites of conditions of social relationship, reasoning, knowledge, and people's action comes at the end of the analysis and takes account of the earlier findings. Okay, so these two were uh, borrowed from the critical realism. Right. So abduction is what we do when we have data that doesn't fit the initial theoretical framework. So how do we make sense of that data? How do we um, use it uh, to develop, you know, new findings? Uh, how do we? And so that's that's where you might, for example, you might go back to your at that point you might go back to your study participants to further probe or to further understand what they have said because you find that, well, what they've said is really outside of the initial theorizing. It doesn't really fit with the initial theory. So we wanna understand it better so that we can then make those references to a, maybe a, um, a new element of the theory, an extension of the theoretical understanding, something related to uh, expanding theory. And that's, that's the, so these three and four really, they're trying to explain the process of how theory is expanded, it's developed, how new theories come out of this type of process, okay? Um, and it's quite complex. Uh, you, there's other articles you can read that will help you to understand it, but it's a good, it's a good, um, it's a good start to, to understand that, um, you know, if you do get data that doesn't fit with that original theoretical framework, 
you know, what you do with it is, is going to help you to, uh, to make contributions to that initial theory that you're using. Okay, so they try to explain the process of how to do that through these two abductive and retroductive approaches. Uh, but they're, they're a bit hard to grasp, especially in the way that it's written. So, um, okay, go ahead, I think. All right, next. Okay, so here is the, uh, the application of the four lines of inquiry. Okay, you can uh, read it on your own, okay, from the article. All right, next. Okay, so here is a uh, data uh, saturation. Okay, so firstly, uh, what is data saturation? Okay, this is where um, uh, when the researcher feels that no new data uh, is emerging or themes are saturated or when um, basically the participant uh, giving you the similar uh, ideas or answers, okay? And then uh, saturation is the key to excellent qualitative work, okay? And uh, uh, sorry, uh, there are no published guidelines, but yet there are no published guidelines or tests of adequacy of estimating the sample size required to reach a saturation, okay? Most 1997. And then saturation occurs when the information being analyzed by the researcher becomes repetitive and the ideas conveyed by the participant have been shared by previous participants and do not result in teams. Okay, being in 1999. So saturation is important. So negative case analysis can also help us, as we mentioned before, with uh, Junji's question about a negative case analysis is a very important tool to use to uh, establish saturation. Okay, so it's important. Okay. Okay. So, all right, so no additional data are, very, are being found whereby the researcher can develop properties of the category as he sees similar instances over and over again. The researcher becomes empirically confident that a category is saturated. When one category is saturated, nothing remains but to go on to new groups for data on other categories and attempt to saturate saturate these categories also. Yeah, so again, this is a very much a grounded theory kind of um, approach to saturation because there's actually in, in qualitative research, you have theoretical saturation, which is what they're talking about here. When you have theoretical concepts that become saturated, but you also have something called data redundancy. So you also, in the literature, you also read about data redundancy. So that's just where you keep hearing the same responses from people, right? And often that's referred to as data, as data saturation. That's because they're in those studies, they're not using a grounded theory, a very conceptual approach. But if you're using, if you're really trying to develop theory or make a, a strong contribution to, um, you know, extending a theory, then you need some evidence that you have, you have saturated those, those theoretical categories. And so that's why... Grounded theory is very big on theoretical saturation and not so much on just data redundancy. Okay, so it's a little bit intricate, but um, it's an important difference uh, to make. So if what, what we're going to learn in this class later in the semester, uh, when we do our data analysis, we're going to develop code books using this approach, using this conceptual approach. So you'll hopefully you'll get a better understanding of what it what saturation, theoretical saturation really means. All right, so. You just finished just in time, Hattie. It's okay, so at the, at, the, at the benefits of theory, okay, the first one, theory provides a means by which to guard against uh, epistemic anxiety where the constant of how much data to collect or whether the data is enough, okay? And the second one, theoretical saturation occurs when all of the main variation of the phenomenon have been identified and not to simply search for finding to confirm, refute theories, maintain open, openness to allow data external to the theory emerge. Yeah. And an important part of the diversification of a sample in quality, quality, uh, qualitative research is to actively search for disconfirming cases. Uh, Gibbs, uh, 2007, perhaps Prof can has been on this later. That's the negative case uh, analysis that we're talking about before, yeah. Okay, uh -huh. and yeah, moving on. Next slide, yes. Okay, we come to the conclusion. All right, so social theory assists researchers to move away from abstract uh, data towards meaningful explanation. Uh, the second one is the, the use of theory before, after the data is ultimately guided by research, uh, research question. And last but not least, designing and, and analyzing the research appropriately will contribute to quality, qualitative research. All right, I think that's about all for us. Thank you so okay. much. 
Thank you, guys. Very nicely done. Uh, good timing. So after the break, we will continue with this topic. I'm going to actually, there's some parts of that article I want to go a little bit more uh, deeper into um, and discuss with you a bit further. Um, so we'll continue with that after the break. Okay. Um, so we'll see you all in a little while. Okay. Enjoy your book pasta. Thank you. Those of you who are breaking fast. See you, Professor. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Okay, everyone back. It's okay if you need a few minutes, go ahead. I'll get started anyway. Okay, so um, for the second half of the class, uh, let's just take a look at, I just want to share my, sorry, share my screen here for a second. Uh, I just want to revisit some of the, yeah, this one here. Um, okay, so for those of you who have the article out or have read the article, um, and you really should read this article, uh, as I said, it's a very important article for quality of students. Um, so in there, in their discussion of the data analysis part, um, uh, they give this example of coding process table. That is a really interesting table actually. Um, it, so it gives us a visualization of the process that they underwent, that they used in their study. Okay, and as you can see here in the table, it's broken down to those three phases of analysis. Okay, so they spoke about coding, uh, sorry, pre, they call it pre-coding, all right? So as, um, uh, who was it that mentioned? I forgot. Uh, oh, it was, oh yeah, Chang, you, you know what I mentioned it. So it's sim very similar to open coding, okay? Conceptually, what they're talking about here is very similar to open coding, okay? And so you can see here, this is the actual data excerpts. These are actual excerpts from transcripts. And they're showing their sort of pre-coding process, okay? And so they pulled out some of these quotes just to identify and to give examples of these initial codes. Like you can see by the highlight, the highlighted, uh, highlighted phrases here, okay? And so then they show how these codes relate to concepts or conceptual categories that were developed, okay? So now these categories, some of them may have come from the literature, from the theory, the theories that they're using, or some may have been developed inductively from combining these different codes here. Okay, they may have developed these conceptual categories um, using either approach. Okay, so it's quite common quality research to develop even codes. You can even identify codes from, um, from literature. You can use, as I mentioned earlier, a pre-coding framework, uh, sorry, a, a pre-existing coding framework that you identify from the literature review, right? And you use that to start your analysis process, okay? Um, you can also identify these, these categories here by using the literature as well. <clears throat> and so they just show how the codes re relate to or refer to these different categories. Um, and then they tie that to the actual theories um, that they're using. Now here, they mentioned they used Lumen's theory and Giddens theory. Right, um, but then they also in in include what are defined as initial theoretical gaps. In other words, 
there's an element, like for example, this category of risk that they talk about here, there's an element of it that's described in Lumen's theory. There's an element of it that's described in Giddens theory, but there's also an element of it that's not discussed by those theories. So they've identified this as an initial theoretical gap. Okay. And then they also have initial empirical gaps. So previously, maybe there's very few studies that have discussed time as an element of trust with doctors. Okay. So they've, I, they've identified that this is an, uh, some element, element of this time category is, uh, speaks to an empirical gap as well as a theoretical gap, but it also speaks to Gideon's theory in some way. Okay. Um, and then other areas for further investigation. Okay, so for example, dependence here um, is obviously a new category. You see, this dependence is not tied to any of the existing theories. It's something that looks like it's completely new to the, uh, it's a completely new finding. Okay, and so they've identified that as an uh, area for further investigation. Okay, it's something totally new. And so they've, so they've categorized there, these emerging findings, these categories, to the theories used in the study, as well as gaps, things that are not spoken to by the theory, as well as uh, areas that require further investigation. So further investigation may mean here going back and doing more interviews in the current study. Um, it may uh, require more data to be collected so that they can better understand this finding, okay? So this doesn't, this table, they don't indicate whether this is the um, coding process uh, at the conclusion of the study or it's midway through the study, they don't indicate. Okay, so um, it, makes, it obviously makes a difference because if this is just midway through the study, we can understand that this bottom category here of other probably refers to the need to go deeper into the existing study to find out what this dependence is all about, okay? And you can see there's also a lot of overlap. You know, there's not some of these. You know, like time is uh, connected to three different theoretic, theoretical category, categorizations here. And there's a definitely an element of it in Giddens' theory, but that doesn't explain all of it. They're saying that there's also something that's not explained by the theory, and there's also um, something that's not explained, or it's not it's not well explained by previous research either. Okay. So this is how they link their findings to theory, all right? And this helps them to then further develop the existing theories and show how the existing theories maybe are not fully able to explain the phenomena that they're studying. Okay, so this is a, a good example of a, a, a sort of structured way of uh, engaging in this process where you're, you can tie your, your findings starting with coding all the way to um, it's its relationship to, to theory, uh, to the theories that you're using in your study. Okay, so I think it's just a good example. Um, and again, this is something that's not, this is not a convention of any way of any sort. This is something they just came up with in terms of how they visualize their study. Okay, so you can do the same thing, All right? I've had students do similar things to this. Um, you know, they have codes and the categories and their themes, and then they have a, 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 a column for their uh, the theories that they're using in their study and how those themes relate to the concepts within the theories. Okay. And so that's another way of doing it. It's quite similar, but, you know, but here they're, what's unique is that they're explicit about the gaps, right? They're explicit about the gaps and they're explicit about things that are, their findings that are not well explained by theory that require further investigation. And that's a really important part of quality research because that's where the novelty comes in. That's where the new, the newness of the finding comes in. And that's where you're going to make a, That's where you're going to make your most, you know, your most important contribution really is on something that's new and something that's been, you know, not yet discovered. Okay. So, are there any questions about any of this? How are you on? How is the group on your gen, general understanding of this topic, in terms of the use of theory in quality research? Confident? Not confident? Still blur? <laughs> Anyone want to check in? Hopefully, okay, I think. <laughs> okay. Yeah, this is the kind of thing where you don't know until you try. 
Um, but let me ask, how many of you have identified your theoretical framework for your study? How many of you have at least fairly confidently def uh, identified a theory or a theoretical framework for your study? Has anyone, anyone in the group? Have you got, maybe you haven't gotten to that phase yet. You're maybe it's still too early for many of you. Anyone? No? Too early. I'm not very confident with it though. Okay. I, uh, for example, like my, my study is actually going to look into developing an, edu an informational or educational website for parents of children with cancer. Wow. And I did... I, I did look into um, I, I did look into the transactional theory of stress and coping and looking into cognitive load theory and uh, several theories but I, I I think I still need to kind of like work on it further to make the the framework more how to say yeah, yeah. Clearer. yeah. right 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 okay that's a very interesting topic. So you're actually going to develop a website for that as part of the research. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm crossing my discipline. <laughs> I, I'm crossing disciplines to learn something that is out of my, my own field, actually. Oh, that's good. That's good. So it's going to be multidisciplinary. So you're going to engage the computer science people? Yeah, one of my co-supervisors is a software engineer. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay, cool. Uh, I've got pediatricians on my supervisory committee as psychologists. Uh, wow. <laughs> and also from education? And some from education? No. Um, no, because I'm actually enrolled under faculty of medicine and health sciences. Oh, you're under faculty of medicine. Okay, okay. Sorry. I assumed you're under education. Okay. I see. Okay. So that means that the study itself, even though it's multidisciplinary, it has to still fit within the the purview of medical as a medical study is that your field of study it, it what is, is your, your exact field of study is what sorry it, what is your exact field of study is it family and community health or your field of study my my field of study actually is uh health education and communication ah health education okay, okay. yeah so it does have it does have elements of um education medicine and uh, software engineering as well yeah so yeah it's kind of it, it's kind of difficult it, it, it's kind of a, a challenge for me lah. but for me because my background i'm i'm actually um, a family medicine uh, doctor as well like from mm. now so i i mean like i've always been interested in patient education and, and yeah. uh, teaching patients new things you see so this is where right. i'm trying to build up yeah Right, right, right. Oh, interesting. So it's not only the content, it's also the, the delivery, the mode of delivery, which is, in, which is part of your study. Sorry, come again? It's not only the content, it's also the mode of delivery, how the, how the information is being yeah. presented and delivered. Yeah. Mm, okay. Yeah, well, by right, I mean, by right, you could, uh, you could also have something from education, I guess, from that perspective. But anyway, well, it's a, well, good luck with it. Interesting study. So that's where, yeah, that's where theoretical frameworks get tricky because when you deal with multidisciplinary types of studies, you, know, you often have to bring in multiple theoretical perspectives as well. So it means a little bit of extra work for you, Tang. <laughs> yeah, but I'm having fun. Uh, I'm discovering uh, theories that I never read about before, like cognitive load theory, and then I'm thinking like, hey, that really. Yeah. Well, that's the idea. Is you're learn you're learning. That's the whole point of a P you know doing a PhD is to learn. So, so yeah. that's good. That's good. Yeah, expand your horizons. Absolutely. I'm Anyone just wondering, else? right? But oh, sorry. Go like ahead. based on this, based on this, this example of how they showed how they coded the the conceptual categorization and the theoretical categorization. When we write up our results, let's say for articles or or they, do we have to display that we do this, or do we just explain that we did this? It's always good to display something. Um, uh, it definitely adds credibility to the study when you can have some kind of uh, display of your, either your analysis or it's actually part of your audit trail because you're really 
displaying part of the research process. Uh, and it helps to establish saturation, for example. You know, a lot of people, they talk about, they talk about saturation, they, but they rarely um, give examples of how they arrived at it. And so I, we're, we're going to discuss this later in the semester, but, um, you know, it's really important that you show, you display evidence that you've achieved saturation. And this is one of the ways to do it. It's something like that, like that table that I showed that's in the article. Or, so they show the connections and, and they show how they conducted their coding and how they connected their codes to their categories. And so as you're narrating in the report, the reader can also visualize how it actually was, can, was carried out. So it makes, a, it makes a big difference. So even in an article, you can throw in one or two of those. You know, um, it def definitely adds that, that sort of credibility to the article. In fact, one of my students in, I have, it's actually my wife's student in vet, uh, faculty of veterinary medicine. I helped her with an article because she did a qualitative study for even in vet medicine. She did a qualitative study of uh, farmers, uh, pig farmers, actually. One with pig farmers, one with cattle farmers. Um, and she did a qualitative study, so I, I sort of helped as the outside sort of person. And um, so she came up with a mental model of how these farmers make decisions. And so in the, pap in the paper, she, she did a fantastic job of coming up with a visual model of the mental model, right? So she's you know, she connected all her, her codes and her categories and into a mental model. It was very nicely done, color-coded and everything. And even the reviewer commented that they thought it was a really helpful diagram, you know? So... You know, these are, you know, a lot of these qualitative findings are quite complex. So any tool you can use to help the reader better understand it is definitely advisable. Yeah. It also helps you as well. You know, as you're going along, as you're doing your, as you're doing your analysis, as you're going through your study, um, one of the things that I, I highly recommend is to keep, you know, after every interview, try to visualize your finding as it's developing. You know what I mean? So every after every round of interviews, you're diagramming your findings, not only, you know, doing the uh, textual analysis, but you're also trying to diagram out what you found so far. And then you can sort of see the evolution of your ideas and the evolution of the theory you're developing, or whatever. Uh, it's really helpful, you know, and, and it'll help you to see whether you're whether or not you're really onto something, whether you really have are grasping this finding that you're getting. You know, um, it's a good tool. It's a good tool. It's a good exercise. Yeah, so. Because when I when I read papers that report qualitative studies, there yeah. are some papers that maybe they actually provide all this additional information in an appendix because of uh, word limits and all that. Yeah. But there are also many journals that actually publish um, qualitative uh, research without providing all this um, evidences. Yeah. So I, I I'm just not sure like you know how. Uh, whether how, how necessary or, or whether we should actually prepare to submit all this thing along with our manuscripts if we write in. Word limitations is a big factor. You have to consider that, you know, but again, think of it as you need to provide, you're going to provide whatever you can to convince the reader, convince the reviewer, convince the editor about your finding and your results. So whatever's going to do that. If you feel like this diagram, I really need this diagram to really help me get my point across, it's really going to help the reader to understand my finding, you know, and you have the space, do it. If you have, if you don't have the space and it's like kind of a trade-off between, you know, do I provide a more in-depth textual description of my finding or I'd use the diagram, you know, you have to make those decisions, like which, which one is more valuable. And that's the problem with, uh, that's one of the problems, not problems, it's one of the challenges of writing quality of journal articles is because of space limitations. You often have to make these kind of decisions. Like we just, I just finished a, a, a mixed methods paper, it took over a year to draft. <laughs> uh, and we were really struggling with the space limitations because mixed methods is, is long, you know, it's two, it's two separate studies in one paper, you know? Um, and so we, at first, you know, we, it was like 11,000 words and then we got it down to 8,000 words, but then the journal we wanted to publish in was only 7,000 words. And we just couldn't cut it down any further. 8,000 was like the lowest we could go. You know, so we had to choose a new, we had to choose a different journal. We had no choice because we couldn't get it down to 7,000 words. We just couldn't. You know, so, you know, those, those are some of the issues with publishing that you have to kind of face. So, but yeah, I think whenever possible, try to include uh, visuals, diagrams, especially in this day and age, everybody's so visual, everyone's very visual now. 
you know, people like pictures, they like visual displays and it's helpful, definitely helpful. Okay, so thanks, Chang. Yeah, did you want to say something? You have a follow up? You want to say something? No, okay. Anyone else? Anyone else have a theoretical framework that you are working with now that you'd like to share? Or at least that you're aware of, that you have, have decided on? Well, that means we need to get reading, uh, if not. So definitely need to think about this. Prof? Yeah. Am I Zura here, Prof? Yeah, yeah. I have one, but I'm not very sure if mine is correct or not. So the theory that I choose for my uh, um, research is the social exchange theory. Yeah. Uh, because I'm doing on um, uh, the links, exploring link between uh, corporate volunteerism uh, in CSR towards employee uh, engagement. Oh, okay. So um, looking at employee engagement, uh, I thought that um, using this theory, uh, social exchange theory, because social exchange theory talks about reward and uh, cost. So yeah. I thought that, you know, CSR should, uh, could be associated with um, um, trust, acceptance, satisfaction, pleasure, companionship that could bring to uh, employee engagement. Sure, sure. Okay. Yeah, social exchange theory is one of those grand theories that is has been well, you know, a lot of empirical um, uh, evidence behind it, you know, so that's not, that's definitely a, what we would call a grand theory. It's used a lot. Um, so it's sort of, a, social exchange is sort of like a broad framework. You can use it for, you know, so many different types of studies. Anytime where there's a sort of transactional element to organizational uh, commitment and stuff like that, you can really bring in social exchange theory. You may want to consider something a more a bit more micro as well that is related more closely to your research setting. Okay, because social exchange is kind of a broad, it's a, it's a, it's good for as a general broad framework, but you may also want to consider another more localized uh, theory that speaks more directly to either the type of organization you're studying or uh, one a specific issue like commitment. Um, I don't know. I, I, I don't know offhand, of course, but um, just something to consider. But it's a good start. At least you have you have that start. Yeah. Um, what is a theory, Prof? Did you have in no, mind what is a theory? You may want to consider an, another theory or another some kind of more mi a, a micro level model that speaks more specifically to your particular study because social exchange is a very broad framework. Right, yes. it, it sort of encompasses many different types of organizational situations and so forth. So, um, if you, I'm just thinking maybe, and social exchange. I mean, even my our bachelor students do studies on using social exchange <laughs> theory. You know, so there's a, there's a lot of literature out there on it. You know, um, so you may want to read some of that literature, some of the local literature in Malaysia, and look at some of the, you know, recommendations for future research or some of the uh, findings that they've come up with and think about maybe there's another additional uh, framework you want to include in your study. Uh, I don't know. Um, okay. But that's a good start. Finding theory yeah. is <laughs> difficult, bro. Like well, hundreds no, it's, of theories no. and then you choose. There's no, it's not about finding theory. It's about looking at the previous literature related to your study and looking at what theories those people have used. All right. Yeah. Okay, so in your literature of you, you're not you don't just want to review the findings of those studies. You also want to review the theories that they've used to study those issues. Because it's the okay. same the same basically the same topic you're studying. So you want to see how have other researchers looked at it? How have okay. they what theories have they used? And then maybe you have a unique take on that topic. So, you know, you you want to bring something new to that to that uh, to that field, to that literature. So you're going to look at it a little bit differently. Because you're going to look at it a little bit differently, you're going to bring in another theoretical perspective, perhaps, maybe. OK, bro. All right. Thank you, bro. So it's, just, it's just part and parcel of your literature review. It's not like, you know, I'm on a theory hunt. I'm looking for theories. <laughs> no, it's just it's part and parcel of your literature review. Just pay attention to what theories they're using, you know, in okay. that review. Yeah. Okay, so there's one more um, thing I want to show. Uh, just a tool. And I think I will put this up on the Pucha Blast as well. Sorry, I just have to find it here. Let's 
Sorry, bear with me for one second. Just have to get this thing ready. So one of the things that was not mentioned in that, art in that article is the fact that um, you can actually use theory differently in your study. Um, okay, so can you all see the, the screen, the role of theoretical frameworks in quantitative research and the mind map? Is it showing a mind map? Yeah. So this is another short piece I'll put up in the Put Your Blast just for your own reference. Um, so they do a sort of, this, these authors, they do a, a kind of conceptual map of um, the role of theory in quality research. So, um, but I just want to focus on this part here. Okay, so here we have the researcher. Okay, all this stuff, but the researcher is not that important. So the researcher uses theoretical frameworks. Okay, so as we read in the article, the benefits of that helps the helps the helps the researcher keep focus. Okay, again, this is a really important part. Uh, really important point. Like uh, Mizura, your study is a good example uh, in the fact from the from the perspective of you know you can study organizational commitment in many ways. Right, so you know um, it can be studied from a, an HRD perspective. It can be studied from an organizational psychology perspective. It can be studied from an, an economics perspective, you know, or a finance perspective. There's so many ways to study that topic. Um, so choosing a theoretical framework delimits your study. Okay, so there's that word delimitation. So some, maybe you've come across this in the literature. Or maybe your supervisor said, you know, what are the delimitations of your study? You're going, what the heck is a delimitation? Delimitation is like a scope of study, study scope, right? So it says, okay, I'm going to look at organizational commitment from the perspective of this, right? So I'm not going to look at it from, you know, every possible perspective under the sun. You know, my field is, say, my field is HRD, human resource development. So I'm going to study it from a human resource development perspective, which means I'm going to choose my theories that are related to HRD. Okay, so my theoretical framework is gonna limit or delimit my study to only looking at the, the topic from within that perspective. Okay, so it helps us to really focus the research rather than trying to look at it from every possible perspective. And so that's actually doing us a favor because if you try to study a topic from too many perspectives, it can get very confusing especially in qualitative research. I mean, first of all, you're gonna have a lot of data to begin with, but if you have a lot of data that's talking about a topic from so many different perspectives, you're just gonna be so confused, so confused. Okay, that's why qualitative research has to be focused. It has to be focused and the emphasis is on depth rather than breadth because otherwise it's impossible to analyze data. In fact, um, Chiang, you mentioned Prof Tung just before, Prof Tung from UKM, right? Is that the person you're referring to? Yeah, so, so Prof Tong once invited me to UKM uh, for a session with his, his graduate students. <laughs> and they were, he's, a, he's an expert in, in grounded theory, um, but his, they were having a dilemma about their analysis and he just wanted another opinion. So he invited me to come and look at their data. And um, so they showed me their, their, they put up their list, I don't know if it was, if it was their list of codes or their questions, I can't remember exactly which it was, but, and they showed me this long list of whatever it was, questions or codes. And immediately, and they said, you know, we feel like we're drowning in the data, you know, drowning in data. Like we, we don't know where, we don't know which, what direction to go in. And immediately it just jumped out at me that they were just trying to cover that topic from way too many perspectives. You know, they had everything under the sun in there. And I looked at it and I said, yeah, if I was in your shoes, I'd be drowning too, because it's just, it's all over the place. Literally, it's all over the place. You just can't make sense of it, right? And so a lot of people, a lot of students have this problem. They try to cover too much. Again, this is quantitative thinking. It really is. It comes from a, a, a background and being taught about, you know, generalization, you know, more is better, broader is better. Um, the more topics you cover, the better, but that's not, that is not the, uh, the, the, the psychology of quality research. So we really want to be focused. So if you say social exchange theory, Mizora, then you need to stay within that within that framework. Now, of course, within the con the context of doing the study, uh, these other things might emerge, and that's fine. And that's where you engage in abductive 
the, the abductive approach of making sense of the data as opposed, you know, along with the theory. How do we make sense of the data and the theory when the theory is not explaining the data? What do we do? We have to go deeper. We have to consider other theories. That's abduct That's the abductive approach. Okay, so, but at least you have that, you have that focus. You have that, that delimitation that keeps you grounded, all right? And it really makes it doable that way. Okay, and then also it situates the author within a scholarly conversation. So then you can really talk about, it allows you to really talk about your contribution to the literature. You know, you have a clear contribution to the literature, to the field, uh, to that topic, you know, and you can really engage with the, um, with the literature that way, right? Because you're working from that theoretical perspective, right? So it, it does uh, assist and facilitate that as well. Okay, so theoretical frameworks are anchored to the foundation of the disciplinary base, the literature of the disciplinary base. So here we, oh, my thing he's got moved. Okay. Um, so concepts, models, theories, all right. Now again, models can be considered theories, okay? Because models are also conceptual. You know, you have, can have a conceptual model that is, maybe it's something that's new. Maybe it's the result of a grounded theory study or something. It's still theory and you can still use it as a, as a theoretical framework, right? So don't think that theory and theoretical framework only means grand theory. All right, and even concepts, broad concepts can also be used as theory. So for example, in my studies, I use a lot of, uh, a lot of my research in youth development is on something called youth adult partnership. Youth adult partnership is not a theory per se, it is more of a concept, but when we write our papers on it, we refer to it as our theoretical framework because it's, it is a theoretical concept that has been used uh, and it has been studied uh, to such an extent that people sort of accept it as a theoretical framework, okay? Even though it's just a concept, it's not an actual theory, right? But that is also considered to be a theoretical framework, okay? Prof? Yeah. Prof, how, how do you um, differentiate concepts and models? Models and theories, yes, we know theories are more um, fundamentally strong, but how do you uh, identify as a student which one is concepts and which one would go into models? Well, model, again, model is sort of like a, if you will, it's a, it's a formal, it's a, it is a type of theory. It's explaining a phenomenon. A model is usually of, of how something occurs, how something works, a phenomenon. So it is, it is very much related to theory in that sense, you know, whereas a concept is just a concept, like youth adult, youth adult partnership is just a concept. It's comprised of two core uh, con uh, constructs, which is youth voice and adult support. It's not explaining how something occurs. It's not explaining a phenomenon. It's just a concept in reality. Social reality is a concept, okay? But it's not necessarily a, a theory that, that's explaining a phenomenon. If, like, if you look at social exchange theory, it explains what? What does social exchange theory explain as a theory? Maizura? <laughs> Social, social asymmetry says that uh, basically we have reward minus cost equals to profit. Okay, so it's explaining some sort of um, transaction within organization, right? Re yeah. Result in some outcome. So that's a process. Yeah, mutual benefit and outcome, yes. Yeah, right. So it's a process. So it's explaining a, a social process. Whereas a concept is just a concept. It's just it's just a it's just a, a term or um, th that reflects you know something in reality but it's not explaining necessarily how something happens okay so uh like tell me an example another example uh, school engagement is a concept right um school engagement is not a theory it's just a, it's just a concept it explains students being interested in school okay so you can use concepts as, as a as part of a theoretical framework as well, as well. All right. So don't think that you're limited to only these big grand grandiose theories. Okay. And then um, so theoretical framework from there, uh, the process. All right. So data to be collected, research questions, the problem to be investigated, 
structures, data analysis, data interpretation, okay, research questions, determine research methodology, right? So, so here, theoretical frameworks inform your theoretical questions, uh, research questions. So don't try not to uh, formulate your research questions without having a, at least a, a fairly good idea of what theoretical framework you're using. In other words, your research questions, they should come from the empirical gaps, the, the, the research gaps that you've identified. Okay, but that's, they should also be informed by your theoretical framework. So for example, my Zuri, your, your your research questions should not be detached from social exchange theory. They should reflect in some way social exchange theory. If not, people say, well, why are you using social exchange theory? Your research questions have nothing to do with social exchange theory, right? So there has to be that clear link between your research questions and your theoretical framework. Ideally, you know, if, you, if you're using a, a theory that maybe has not been empirically tested in this study context that you're working in, that can even be one of the research questions, right, uh, directly. Okay, but either way, the research questions should definitely reflect your theoretical framework, all right? If not, there's a big, there's some sort of big, something that's going on there. There's a disconnect, okay? Uh, and then, so your research questions, inform research methodology and all that. Okay, so this is just the process here. Now in this next, um, scroll down here. Let me just scroll down here. Now, this is kind of small. I'll try and blow it up. Um, so what they've done here is, okay, they've given some examples um, from actual studies. Uh, I'm not gonna go through all this. I just wanna give some examples, but uh, they give some examples of studies, uh, the author, purpose of the study, the theoretical framework used, okay? Uh, data collection method, analysis method, role of the framework. So people, uh, uh, scholars will use theoretical frameworks differently. Sometimes they'll only use theoretical frameworks for data analysis and interpretation. In other words, they will, uh, depending on the type of study they're doing, they may like here, um, see this study here, Bettison Mills, okay? So let me just, sorry, I'm just trying to find my, all right, so Bettison Mills, this one here. So the purpose of the study was to focus on faculty's understanding of their professional identities on a new academic department. Um, theoretical framework, the concept of liminality. Okay, so here, my Zora is an example of a concept as a, Theoretical framework, liminality, was used as the theoretical vehicle to make sense of the dynamic interaction between individual faculty members' responses to changes in their work lives and identities and the changing political, economic, and social landscape of higher education, okay? So they're just using this concept of liminality. They're not even using a, a actual theory, okay? Now, I'm not familiar with the concept of liminality. I can't elaborate on it, but we see this in a lot of studies, okay? Um, they, we, these, are grand, these are big concepts that are used. Um, the role, now it says here, the role of the theor theoretical framework, the role of the framework was mostly used in the data analysis and interpretation phases. Okay, so they really used the theory for the most part, just in the data analysis and interpretation phases. So they used the theory to help them to really make sense of their findings and interpret their findings. Okay, and that's quite common. So again, for example, you have this concept of liminality, maybe it has, maybe this concept of liminality has five subconcepts, and they use those five subconcepts to do their coding, right? To do their coding, right? And then from there, etc. Now, again, there may be new things coming into that, um, which is always a possibility in qualitative research, but at least they use the, this concept of liminality to uh, at least begin the process of analyzing their data. Um, and so it's mostly used at that phase, okay? Here in the, second, in the second study, it says the theoretical framework took a very important role in identifying the research questions. But basically what the author tried to do is in a certain way to test such theory. So in this, even though it's a qualitative study, they used a very sort of deductive approach where they're almost, almost trying to uh, test the theory. Even though it's not like testing it in, in quantitative, that's not what they mean. 
All right. Okay, so you can use theories theories differently in qualitative research. It doesn't have to be throughout the entire study. You can emphasize the research questions. You can emphasize um, the analytical framework that you're using, the coding framework. Okay, uh, again, it's really up to you. Uh, let's look at some of these other ones here. Okay, so here, broad framework. This one, um, for this study, uh, Mills again, Mills and Bennett. For this study, the authors had the broad framework of social construction identity. Under that umbrella, the authors selected theories of organizational identity and identification. So they used sort of multiple theories here. The role of theoretical framework was mostly used in the data analysis interpretation. For the case of the study, the theoretical framework played a role in the data collection as well. The entries in the journals were influenced by the framework. So said they used journal analysis. Do you guys know, what, anyone know what journal analysis is? Have you ever heard of journal analysis as a as an as a, a method in qualitative research, also known as journaling? Sometimes they call it journaling. Okay, so it's like where you ask your participants to actually uh, you give them a journal, or nowadays they'll probably be on a computer, but um, you ask them to do like a weekly reflection on something. You know, so write down your um, ex you know your experiences over the past week um, in your in your uh, weekly meetings, you know, and then ask them to react or give some reflection on those. Okay, and then you analyze those journal entries. So it's a form of document analysis. All right, it's a form of document analysis. So uh, it's quite common, a lot of quality research studies will use it, journal analysis. Okay, and this is they also use focus groups. So the framework, the theoretical framework here was used to guide the participants in writing in their journals. So for example, they probably gave them a set of maybe five or 10 questions that they wanted them to reflect on every week. Okay, and those questions came from the theoretical framework. All right. And so of course, then they would analyze the data according to that framework as well. All right. So that's another way of, of using theory. Another way of using theory. Okay, uh, let's see what else we got here. Now, here they use multiple theories. Okay, so for this study, Karpiak, the purpose of the research was to identify the ways in which social workers traverse this developmental period, what changes they might undergo, and how these changes might be expressed in their personal lives. The data was analyzed using Jung's model of personal development, Levinson et al.'s model of midlife transition, and Prijogin and Stenger's theory of chaos and complexity. So here they're making use of three different theoretical frameworks. Okay. Um, the interview, the theoretical framework supported the in, author's interview method, so data collection. Also, the framework was used to analyze the data by employing a theoretical template based on theory. So again, an, analysis and of course, interpretation. So you find them almost all of them, they all use theory in their analysis interpretation phases, all right? So that's quite common through most of them. Right. So, so the analysis is not starting with a totally blank slate. They're starting with some kind of guide on in, in terms of their analysis, right? Whether that's pre-exist, a pre again a pre-existing coding framework, pre-existing sort of categories, we don't know, but they're all making use of their theory of theoretical framework for analysis and interpretation. Okay, same here. Again, finding direction and understanding the data. All right, so I will also, um, and they're here, they just give some explanation of these different things. So we can, we can read this on your own, but um, I will upload this as well. This is kind of uh, a useful, it's very short, just a few pages, um, synopsis of this use of theory. They just sort of explain uh, in more detail here. Okay, so I will upload this uh, to Pucha Blast as well. Okay, so uh, any any questions, any comments? So again, this is a topic where if you're not yet in this phase of your study, it's gonna seem quite, um, 
abstract, right? And maybe a little hard to follow at this point. Um, but again, once I think once you start doing your literature review, seriously doing your literature review, which you should be already doing if you're in your, even if you're in your first, second semester, you should be already into your literature review. You know, pay attention to theory. Pay attention to the theories that are being used in your in the articles you're reading, okay? Um, and how those uh, authors are using the theories in their studies, all right? So it's not only on findings, but also on theory. Okay, so that's really important. All right, any questions or comments? Wow, you guys are also quiet tonight. I think you're ready for a, a chutti semester. <laughs> I think everyone's ready for a semester. Hey, Maria, ask too much questions. <laughs> uh, hey, in my class, there's no such thing as too many questions. Really, I, I mean that. I mean that. I, I, I expect I expect students to ask questions. If you don't, if you don't ask questions, that's when I get really worried. So you can never ask too many questions in my class. Seriously. I, I was just wondering. I mean, I'm really, really wondering. Yeah. I can understand how we use quantitative research to test uh, theory because you look at associations and prove that, you know, this variable is associated with this variable. But how do we use qualitative research to test a theory? You don't, you don't see it too often. Um, it's very rare that, very rare that uh, a researcher will say that they're actually testing the theory using qualitative methods. You won't come across it very often. Um, but what they do, like in some studies, especially grounded, it's quite common in grounded theory to validate or to not validate. They use verify more than validate, but sometimes they'll say validate. To verify the theory that they've developed in grounded theory, they will use a lot of like negative case analysis. They'll go out of their way to try to find cases that contradict the theory just to see whether the theory is complete, whether it's really saturated. And so in those Case, in those particular instances, they will make mention of, you know, um, the data that we came up with, um, not necessarily test the theory, but sort of validated the theory, right? And they have, But they have to show those connections. So they have to show the data, the quote, quote or quotes, whatever it is that they have, the evidence, and relate that to their theory or the theoretical constructs they've come up with. So they have to show that, you know, they have to show evidence of that. So those quotes or that textual data, whatever they're using, really has to um, support their theoretical constructs that they've come up with, you know, and so yeah, it's not easy to do, but a lot of the grounded theory studies will do that. Um, but you don't, you don't, you don't find it too often, uh, Chang. It's not very common because I mean, why? If you want to really test the theory, just do a quantitative study. You know, I mean, it, it, there has to be a reason. If maybe sometimes in a mixed method study they'll do it, or there has to be some reason why they want to do it that way. Some sort of unique kind of reason. So, Prof, it means in qualitative study, yeah. they sometimes test um, um, theory testing happens, is it? Because I thought theory testing only happens in quality, yeah. does not well, happen no, in quality. It rarely, it rarely happens. But sometimes, once in a while, you will come across a study where they do use that kind of language. They say they're actually testing. It's not very common. So, it's not very common. But it happens. Yeah, you know it what? Happens. I'll be really honest with you. Uh, Mizor, I'll be really honest with you. Uh, a few semesters ago, um, we were discussing this in my class, in this class. And a student came in and said, Prof, I, know I read this article that, you know, that said that they, you, they're testing theory using qualitative research. And at that time, I said, no way. It's, you know, I've never heard of such a thing. It's impossible. And then they sent me the article. And sure enough, they did. They, they, uh, the authors did use that, that language and, and, and that approach. So ever since then, I cannot say that it's <laughs> they don't do it. It's never done. One, it is rare. It's rare, but it does it does happen sometimes. But it's because it's not usually common. when when we study quantity and quality, the difference testing theory always goes under post positivism. Yeah. It doesn't go into the interpret interpretation yeah. uh, area. You see, interpreters. Yeah, it's it's rare. It's very rare. But again, it, it's I mean deduction. The purpose of deduction again is to sort of just. Um, is to really prove uh, or show proof that this theory holds true. And, you know, so that's why it's, it's much more amenable to quantitative methods where you can do hypothesis testing and all that. Um, it doesn't really work. I don't know why people would do it that way, to be honest. It just doesn't seem like 
the kind of approach you would use to test a theory. You know, I mean, I can like in mixed methods, we 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 use it for uh, we use mixed methods, but so we'll start with a quantitative you know study and we'll test, for example, like in a path analysis, you'll test relationships, right? Pathways or relationships. And then you want to understand those pathways more in depth. So you follow up with a qualitative study, right? And that's mixed methods. And that makes total sense. You know, you want to provide context to understand those, those pathways that are, that are um, uh, significant, right? So that makes total sense, but you're not proving the pathway with the qualitative. You're proving the pathway with the quantitative, right? But you're just elaborating or going in depth as to why there's a significant relationship with the qualitative. You're not proving it through the qualitative. You know, so it's very different. So, you know, again, you, there, in, 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 in the world of science, you know, you, you come across these anomalies, you know, that, you know, you say, oh, you never, you cannot use qualitative research methods to test theory. And then you'll come across an article that says they tested theory. <laughs> yeah, and like, okay, well, it does happen, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's good science either. You know what I mean? Like they may have done it that way, but it may not really have worked very well. <laughs> I don't know. So, you know, I mean, for the most part though, you won't find it very often. It's not, it's not common. So. All right. Anything I else? We, we use quantitative um, research to generate theory, right? Yeah. Generate to extend theory to contextualize theory, uh, to broaden theory. Yes, all those things, yes, but not to test theory, not to test theory. Yeah. I mean, the other issue is the fact that you're not using, uh, you know, in qualitative research, you're using purposive sampling, you're using non-probability sampling. So just the fact that you're using non-probability sampling sort of rules out the ability to really test theory because you're not, you know, it's, it's it just, it just doesn't make sense, but sometimes they do it. I know people want to be different nowadays. He's in class, then. Can I Okay, sorry. Uh, there's a question. How can how do I understand the difference between the can, how do I understand the difference between the theoretical framework and the conceptual framework? Okay, so that's another good question. Uh, sorry, I have my my PA with me. <laughs> You're all sweaty. <laughs> how do I understand the difference between the conceptual? Yeah, so this is another question that often comes up: uh, difference between theoretical and conceptual frameworks. And to be honest with you, even if you read the literature on this topic, you're going to come across different opinions. Some say it's the same thing. Some say um, uh, some they they in, they sort of intermingle the definitions, right? So they really mean the same thing, although they'll call it different things. Typically, a theoretical framework is like social exchange theory. Okay, so social exchange theory is your theoretical framework. Now, how you conceptualize social exchange theory in your particular study becomes the conceptual framework, right? So, for example, um, yeah, you take social exchange theory, but you explain it, you describe it, you um, portray it according to the specific organization that you're studying, for example, Mizura. Okay, and you are taking, um, I'm using your example, Mizora, because it's a good one. It's an easy one to understand. And so maybe within social exchange theory, you know, maybe social exchange theory has five core constructs, but for your particular study, you're only focusing on three of those constructs, right? So that would be your, concept, your conceptual framework. So from the big theoretical framework, you are going to come up with a conceptual framework that's specific to your study. Okay, and it's much more, it's much easier actually to uh, understand in a quantitative study than a qualitative study because a conceptual framework in a, qu in a quantitative study is essentially those concepts that you're studying, that you're gonna, sorry, that you're gonna test, right? So from social exchange theory, which is my theoretical framework, I'm gonna draw out those, those you know, four or five concepts and then I'm gonna show in a framework how I'm gonna actually test them. 
you know, using my research, uh, and the research approach that I'm using, whatever, maybe it's path analysis, whatever, but you just show the relationships that you're going to test in your study. So that'd be a conceptual framework. But for qualitative, you know, it's a little, it's a little more gray. Some studies have them, some studies don't have them. Okay. But every study should have a theoretical framework. And a conceptual framework is not required. If you want to have a conceptual framework, that's fine. A lot of times, uh, researchers will develop conceptual frameworks for the end of the study. So for after they get the results, they put forward a conceptual framework that explains their phenomenon. Okay, so that's similar to like developing a model. Okay, so that's another way of using conceptual framework in qualitative research. Some will start with a conceptual framework at the beginning, and then they'll show how it, how it evolved at the end of the study from the results. So they develop a conceptual framework from literature, and then at the end they show a new conceptual framework that uh, is a result of both the literature as well as the findings. So you sort of combine them into one conceptual framework. So uh, Yishan said, I found some journals use theoretical frameworks, some use conceptual framework, and some use both. Yeah, exactly. That's why it's, it's, it can be confusing. Right? It can be confusing. Um, so like I said, I, I, would, I would always make sure you have at least a theoretical framework, right? And whether you want to add an additional conceptual framework to that as well, it's up to you. You don't have to. Um, so like I said, some studies have them, some don't. Right. Because a lot, again, a study that uses a broad theory doesn't necessarily explain what exactly you're going to study in your particular study and how you're going to study it. So, a conceptual framework takes that theoretical framework and puts it in the context of that particular study. Okay. So, you may choose to use it or not. You may choose to have it or not. Okay. Oh. Uh -huh. A pro, can we say in that case, theoretical framework is a theory that comes from the scholar, whereby conceptual framework, what we get from the um, research that we have done, if let's say we, we modify or we change the theory, is it wrong to say like that, Pro? No, it's not wrong. Um, it's not wrong. It can also be, but like a conceptual framework can also, so for example, um, using social exchange theory, your theoretical framework may be social exchange theory. But from your review of the literature, you've identified additional concepts or variables that you want to include in your study, okay, that are that go beyond social exchange theory. So you come up with a conceptual framework that includes social exchange theory, but it also includes two or three other variables that you found from your re literature review. And you put that into a framework and you call that the conceptual framework because that's, that's the framework that you're studying for your study. Okay, even though the general theoretical framework is social exchange theory, the conceptual framework includes other things as well. Okay, and then like you said, at the end of the study, you can also present a conceptual framework. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Rahman. Yeah. Uh, just I want to ask about uh, choosing the theories. We said we, we can choose them based on the theoretical uh, framework. Uh, or theoretic uh, theory uh, theories and literature uh, literature uh, reviews but uh, choosing these uh, theories is it uh, should be mostly based on or related more to iv or dv okay. or both of them there's no iv there's no iv dv in a qualitative study rahma no, i'm asking about mixed method i am using mixed oh, method and okay yeah yes so, so no, I'm wondering, is it there is no such thing as a theory that just describes one variable. Like mm -hmm. I said, a, like I said, a theory, a theory explains or describes a process. So you want to find a theory that explains the relationship between the IV and the DV. Mm -hmm. I see. A lot of students have this, this misunderstanding about theory. And when it, this is more related to quantitative research, but this idea that you choose like each variable in your study has its own theory. No, that's that's not that's not how you use theory. A theory doesn't explain a variable. A theory explains the relationship between variables. So you want to choose theory or theories that explain those relationships, not individual variables. 
Yeah, because sometimes, you know, I'm confused. I read so many articles and no, they are. Yeah, yeah, that's part of learning. <laughs> it's yeah. working out that confusion. So it's a good question. Yeah. I'm glad you asked the question. It's a good question. You know, just yeah, please, but yeah, which, please. Which I mean, I've seen, because it's, it's funny, I've seen like bachelor students, bachelor students, they'll have their, uh, their conceptual frameworks, they'll have three variables, two IVs and one DV, and they'll have three theories to explain those three variables. <laughs> That's a lot of theorizing for three variables, okay? Um, no, you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't uh, have a theory explaining each variable. You try to come up, try to identify a theory that explains those relationships. So you may have two theories in that particular instance, one that explains IV, IV to DV1 and then IV2 to DV as well. Right, so <clears throat> for each of those relationships, there may be a, a separate theory, but not one theory for each variable. Mm -hmm. so, so like two is enough, three is uh, it's not acceptable? About number. It's not about number, it's not about number. <laughs> it can be one. No, it can be just yeah. one, you can just have, we have one theoretical yeah, framework, not theory. theory. Yeah. It doesn't, it, you know, the number of theories you use doesn't make the, the research any better. <laughs> You know, it's not like, oh, I used 55 theories in my study, therefore I'm going to get my PhD tomorrow. I mean, I've seen, I, it's really, the other thing is I've seen some qualitative studies that they just use way too many theories. You know, like they, they have a theoretical framework that has four theories in it. But then when you look at their interview guide, they've only got seven or eight interview questions. How do you cover four theories in an interview with just seven questions? It's impossible. You cannot. Because your interview guy, your interview questions that you ask in the interview, they should be drawn from the theory, theoretical framework that you're using. Okay. So if your questions have nothing to do with your theoretical framework, then you've already got a disconnect between the theory you're using and the data you're going to collect. Right. So there's no point. You know, so remember in an interview, quality of interview, you may only get eight or 10 questions, maybe a bit more, maybe a bit less. You know, so you have to be able to, you have to, be able to ensure that. What you're going to cover in those interviews is drawn from you th the theories that you're using. That way you ensure that there's the connection between theory and the data you're going to collect. Okay, so that's also really important to keep in mind. So don't over theorize in qualitative studies. Don't like, oh, I need to add four more theories because otherwise it won't be PhD level, blah, blah, blah. That's nonsense. <laughs> that's nonsense. It has nothing to do with the number of theories you're using. Most students, most students can't do justice to one theory to really explain one theory and really ex interpret their findings really well from one theory. So there's no point in like trying to come up with them, you know, oh, I need more theories. And, you know, even if you have just one theory, but you really understand that theory really well, you use it pro appropriately, you help, you know, you've really made a contribution to, to, to that, uh, that theory and so forth. That's enough. That's enough. <laughs> Okay, anything else? No more questions, okay. Um, I do have some, I ha do have a few slides because I in the um, basic, when I used to teach the basic quality research class, I did have a, a lecture on theoretical frameworks and I did, there is some material in there that does some compare and contrast between theoretical and conceptual frameworks. So maybe uh, next week, I'll just bring those slides just to share with you, um, just to help maybe provide a little bit more clarity on that issue uh, between theoretical conceptual frameworks. But I did do a survey of the literature on this topic, and I did find that there's just as much confusion among scholars as there is among <laughs> everybody else. There, you'll find there's so many, there's so many differences of opinion about conceptual and theoretical frameworks in the literature. It's, it can be very confusing. So don't don't feel bad if you're confused about that topic. All right, but we'll try to uh, clarify as much as we can, inshallah. All right, well we're almost at nine o'clock, so um, I guess we'll sign off. So have a have a good good break. Salamat hari raya early to all those who are celebrating raya. Um, Salango just underwent MCO today. Uh, at least six of our districts in MC, uh, in Selangor. So we're going to another uh, confined Raya. Um, but we just have to be patient, inshallah.
It'll be over yes, soon. Well, it is very touching. Yeah, I just got the news right before class. Mm -hmm. So but anyway, we just have to be patient. So uh, so anyway, enjoy, enjoy whatever, whatever you do. Um, stay safe uh, and we'll catch up again in two weeks, inshallah. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Well, Selamat okay. Hari Raya, Prof. Selamat Hari Raya. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Selamat Hari Raya. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Selamat Hari Raya. Good night. Okay. Hari Raya, Prof. Thank you. Thank you, too. Thank you, Prof. 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 Thank you, Prof.